Hello and welcome to the Dragon Slayer podcast, the podcast all things Dragons IFC and rugby in the region. Hope you're all doing well. I'm Jamie and joining me as always is my co-host Gavin Thomas. How are we, Gav? Well, Jamie, how are we? We've won. We've won at home. We've won against one of the health regions uh, and we won convincingly. So, yeah, I'm I'm very well. Despite some of the other disasters that befell me this weekend, that is the highlight. Yes. Uh, how is your boy? Do you just want to explain to the listeners uh, you had a bit of a, an accident, didn't he, on the football field? Oh, yeah. It was, uh, he was round in a goalkeeper who swept his leg from underneath him and he's damaged, uh, damaged his ACL. So he's... Uh, oh, gosh. He's struggling to... It, it's not bad, but he, he is struggling to walk a bit. But I did spend... A chunk of the weekend sat in uh, in A and E in uh, in Hastings. Oh dear, well, speedy recovery. I hope he's uh, okay because that sounds pretty nasty, to be honest. Uh, yeah, it, it wasn't as bad as it could have been. He just landed quite heavily, and it was a uh, concrete based astro, and it was just, you know, it's under tens football. It wasn't malicious, but he was travelling the pace and ended up going arse over tit for a want of a more technical phrase. <laughs> oh dear. Okay, so we are available on Apple Podcasts, we're on Spotify, and we're on the Sports Social Network. So if you like what we do, please subscribe, uh, leave us a kind review, and tell your Dragons mates about the pod, because it really does help us to uh, to grow the podcast. So tonight is a special pod, Gav, for two reasons. Number one, it's a victory pod. <laughs> we're very happy about that. We don't know how many times you're going to say that on this podcast with the Dragons, so you've got to make the most of every win you Absolutely. get. So. Yeah. I'm not even joking with that. That's just how it is. So, um, yeah, happy days, victory pod. But we have a special guest with us tonight. And he had two spells with the Dragons, making his debut against Cardiff in 2010 and made in total 119 appearances for the region, scoring 22 tries and 124 points. Very talented utility player who was able to play at centre, wing and fullback. And he became a fan favourite of Ronnie Prade for his very reliable performances. One of my favourite Dragons players, always pretty good shift. So, without further ado, welcome to the pod, Adam Hughes. How are we, Adam? I'm very good, thank you, guys. Thanks for having me on. Not a problem. It's a pleasure. So, let's start at the beginning then, Adam. Um, how did it all start for you? What was your journey into rugby? How did you come to uh, get into the sport? So it was mainly, I started off a little bit at Newport High School All Boys when I was really young. Uh, then I had a gap of not playing until I went to Crossy Killio Comprehensive School. And we, by, by then, we'd had a really good team. I'd moved to Cambran uh, RFC and the school side was pretty much the club side. And we, we had a really good team. And um, yeah, we were very successful going up through the age groups and got picked up uh, in the usual routes, really, by a sort of Gwent County, then into the Dragons Academy in what was its very early days at the time. And then worked my way up through the systems, then 16s, 18s and 20s into the seniors. So um, a fairly typical type route. Um, but, uh, yeah, very different to what it is now, I would imagine. Yeah, absolutely. So... You made quite the impression in your first season of Rodney Parade. So you were voted Supporters Player of the Year by the readers of the South Wales Argus and he was voted Young Player of the Year by the club. I mean, that must have been a massive confidence boost for you at the time, isn't it? Coming through and you, you really did make a big impression of Rodney Parade. Yeah, it was pretty surreal at the time because I think I I played nearly every and started nearly every game that season. So you know, just to go injury free w w was absolutely brilliant. But then to um to back it up with some performances because you are really running on adrenaline for that first debut season. You know, you are yeah. you're almost so excited for every single game. Um and uh, yeah, the, and the players that were in the team at that time as well. So to win those awards really did mean a lot because there were some real quality players around in that team at uh, the Dragon. Yeah, I'm trying to think, who was the coach at the time when you made your debut in 2010? Would it be it Paul Turner? Paul Turner gave me my my debut, and then we lost Paul. I remember we were travelling to sail away in the LV Cup, and uh, we all came in to get on the bus to be told that Paul was no longer with us, and, and Darren must oh. have taken over. All right. And, of course, Paul Turner is coming back to the Dragons as a consultant. Do you think that's a, a good move, Adam? It's an interesting move. I got. I haven't really followed Paul's career since he he left us. I know he was coaching in the championship. Um, he will definitely add a a bit of spice to that back line. There were some interesting moves. 
um, you know, you, he will want them to be throwing the ball around, which is where we were very successful back in the day. Um, and uh, you never know, he might even bring the wall back in. You might see the wall again from a free kick, which we haven't done for a long time. <laughs> I, I don't think World Rugby allows that anymore. <laughs> uh, sadly, all the flying yeah. V from a, uh, a tap penalty, they don't allow yeah. that either. <laughs> That's a shame. <laughs> so... You started Life of Dragons really well, but then in 2014, you leave the Dragons and you go to Bristol yeah. for a short-term loan. And then you get picked up by, well, Baxter, the Exeter Chiefs. So how did it come about the move to Bristol then? Was it, did you fall out of favour or was it a decision that you made that you wanted to leave the club and go for a new adventure in the, in the English League? Or how did that sort of come about? So that came about really where I'd had a bit of a run of injuries at that point. Lynn had come in, Lynn Jones, and he'd made it very clear he almost wanted to start completely fresh and wanted to literally go with with the youngsters, which is absolutely fine. So um, I said to, pretty much said to him, look, I, I'd, I'd already been offered a, a, a contract by the Chiefs halfway through that season. And I said, look, if, if I'm not in your plans, can I please go and play elsewhere for the rest of the year? And to be fair to Lynn, yeah, he, he said, sure, no problem at all. I'm not going to hold you back or stop you playing if that's what you want to do. So Lynn was very good with me. Let me go to Bristol for a couple of months, which was which was genuinely awesome at the time. Um, to play in a, a packed deck mem every single week was a real experience, very similar to, to Rodney Parade. Um, and uh, yeah, so it was just really good to experience a different culture. Uh, and then obviously go into the Chiefs where the, the culture is, is one of the very best. Uh, it was a great learning curve. Yeah, I was just wondering, how does it compare sort of playing in the English Premiership to what would have been, well, the Pro 12 or the Pro 14 back then? Uh, what did you find was the main differences? It's just the intensity of, of every game. In, in, it's in the Pro 12 as it was, and even in the URC now, there are weeks whereby you are up for games a lot more than others, depending if you're playing the Blues, the Ospreys, or Zebra and the Lions, for example. It, your mentality is different for those games. Whereas in the Prem, there's almost a huge amount on every single game. Relegation is a big part of it, but also the history and tradition within those games and the rivalry that the fans have with those opposition clubs creates that intensity for almost every single game. Yeah. So of those games, which of the English teams playing against kind of sticks in your head? Which were the big games for you, Adam? So being in Exeter, it was always, as you can imagine, the West Country derbies were well thought of. Uh, but it was the brewing of the rivalry with Saracens at the time as well. They were always games where Baxter was desperate to win. Really, even back then, you know, twenty, you're talking 2015, 16, they're desperate to win. Um, and you typically Leicester Tigers as well, because you know Exeter were just coming up through the ranks at that point. They'd won the LV Cup. They were going back to a challenge for the league. You know, Exeter were a team that, that the top boys didn't want to come through. They wanted to knock them down. They saw them as a threat. Um, so every every game was a real biggie, and because we were riding this positive wave, the extra crowds were really behind us, and and uh, Sandy Park was brilliant to play in. It sounds like you really enjoyed your time. I mean, you wasn't there long, but it does sound like you enjoyed your time at the Exeter. And what's Will Baxter like to work with as a coach? Because I came across an old article that you wrote for the South Wales Argus, because you used to be like a regular columnist, didn't yeah. you? And you wrote, "It's interesting to see how different all the coaches are in the game." One season, I went from Rob Baxter to Lynn Jones. Both are very good coaches, but have an extremely different approach to coaching. Do you just yeah. want to expand on that first? So, 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 so Rob, Rob Baxter is, is a very, as you see him, you know, you, you listen to his interviews after the game. He is uh, straight as a die. Uh, he will tell you exactly what he's thinking. Um, discipline is, is absolutely huge to Rob. And what I liked about Rob was he set the example. So, you would never, ever arrive to training and he wouldn't already be there. You'd never leave training and he wasn't still at his desk. You know, that was the example him yeah. his coaching team set was, I'm going to work harder than you. I expect you to work as hard as I'm working. Um, and he, he was very disciplined as well, but but also very set in his ways. You know, he had his absolute way of playing. He had the the, the team and the players he wanted to play and that was it, you know, and it was, it was very difficult to fall in and out of that. Uh, Lynn, on the other hand, uh, a very, very interesting character. We've all heard stories about Lynn. 
um, he's the sort of person whereby you've got to take everything with a pinch of salt, which is obviously the opposite to Rob Baxter. Uh, and certainly <laughs> one for the mind games was, was Lynn Jones. So an interesting yeah. time. So I, I kind of I'm interested by Exeter because they, you know, as you said, they rose up the ranks and that now they are a power in this rugby. How do you think Rob Baxter did that? You know, they were well funded. There was a good squad there, but they they didn't have the Galacticals perhaps of uh, of the Saracen. So how do you think he did that, uh, Adam? So I think he is he and his coaches, and they haven't changed at all since they almost started. They stuck to their guns, so they were never changed the way they play, depending on who the opposition was. They knew their strengths. They played to their strengths of the team they had. And, and like you say, don't get me wrong, they had the most incredible crop of youngsters come through at once. When you think of your Knowles, your Slade, your Dickies, your Dave, your, like, yeah. that is an unbelievable amount of talent to come through in one age group. But they utilised that. They, they went to what their strengths were. And they just repeat and repeat and repeat. Because you can remember, Exeter getting your 22, they score a try. It, it was just literally as straightforward as that, wasn't it? Um, and uh, they, they stuck with it. And, and a bit like Saracens, they stuck, they stick to a certain way of playing and they do not change that. And that breeds success over a period of time. Yeah, what I always liked about Exeter was they didn't have like a star-studded squad. They they they'd have like hard working players. They weren't big names, but they always seemed to work in Krabby Island and be really good players, isn't it? You know, they oh, they made yeah, the most so, of what they had. Yeah, you know, and that's one thing. So the the conditioning team down at the Chiefs is run by ex Royal Marines, uh, because because oh, right. because of, of the link to to the Royal Marines down that way. So they're all ex Royal Marines. A lot of the conditioning staff and medical staff, and it is run that way. You know, you do work. Mm. The hardest you can possibly work, you know. A preseason down at Exeter is is quite literally beyond belief at times of, of the amount of work you do, um, and and it and then it pays off in the long season. And I mean, it's a sharp contrast to being at Ronnie Parade and having to train on the cabbage patch and <laughs> work it out in the oh, old tin shed as you would oh, have done then, isn't it? Oh, honestly, <laughs> there is there is there is times when we were playing in the Heineken Cup. You know, we were playing against Toulouse when they were the Real Madrid of, of European rugby at yeah. that time. We were literally getting texts the night before about where to train the following day. You know, it, it was it was crazy. Oh. You know, we 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 didn't have a training ground. We had no set shed schedule. Um, we were just literally winging it uh, for a while. And uh, but we, we it almost brought everyone together really really well. It created a very yeah. sort of tight knit bond and a tight team. Um, but. Uh, it did improve drastically. You know, they did try, you know, we ended up going to the high school, which wasn't ideal, but better than what we had. And now they've got that brilliant training ground up at Astro. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing though, isn't it? Like we, we didn't have facilities, the resources, but in our Paul Turner era, we were still a very competitive team once we had them, you know, more competitive than we've been in recent years. So there's something oh, to be said for that, isn't there? You, we, we wouldn't lose a home game. You know, we, we, no. the, pride, the pride we would have of, of playing at, in front of a Pat Rodney parade, especially on a Friday night, was huge. Uh, and it would be yeah. a case of not losing at home and picking up the odd good away win, you know, and, and that really put set the team in good stead. But you look back, and I was only talking to somebody the other week, uh, the, you just look at the pack we had. It was insane, absolutely insane yeah. when you go through it. You know, just look at the second row, Sedoli and Charles. You know, that's a, mm. that's a second row pair and you dream of these days. Oh, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, yeah, and you had like to you know Toby and Dan Lydia and you had Gavin Thomas and those like in the back row. It was it was very, very good. Yeah, and people talk about, you know, making Rodney Parade a fortress. You hear this all the time from the coaches and supporters. It hasn't been that way for a long time, I don't think. But in your day when you was playing, that's when it really was, wasn't it? Those Friday nights, very special oh, for Rodney Parade. I'm just listening yeah. to those names. You know, that is a hell of a sight. And, you know, that's an international second row and back row there. You know, that is a hell of a team. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, we had Lloyd Burns, a hooker. We had Jabber, a hooker as well. Um, you know, you know, that's real sort of strength and depth. And one thing you talk about Rodney Parade as a fortress, I always used to assess it by, you remember that lap we used to do at the end of the warm-up? That used to get, that the Rodney Parade used to erupt in the, on that lap um, yeah. back in the day, you know, when it was full, it, was a dar it might be a derby game or a big game. And I went to a game not long ago, and it's just, 
wasn't there anymore. You know, that, it's not the same, is it? No, it's not. It's not the same. Um, you know, that that gave you a massive um, kick going into the change room pre-game. That used to, um, but yeah. it's just, it's just not. The, I I understand why. You know, it's not. It's not the fans' fault. You know, it's been ten years plus, probably of, of um, not uh, ideal results, and people have dropped off. But yeah. you know, it's uh, it would be great to get it back to what it was like then. Yeah. How how does that happen, though, Adam? Yeah, I'm I'm giving you a magic wand. You're gonna solve the the problems of Gwent rugby in one <laughs> sweep. Be a magic wand like Harry Potter. How, yeah. What what happens? How do you solve it? Well, let, let let's put the the obvious one out of the way, which is money. The money's not there, so no. let, let's not save money, um, because we all know that would fix most of the problems, but it it simply doesn't exist. Um, and in, in my opinion, it is just purely my opinion and, and my experiences is we just have to make the league and the games we play just more meaningful. Uh, I really, really believe that. It, in my opinion, I don't like the URC. I think there's too many games whereby fans don't mind. Well, like we lose to the Lions, we lose to the Sharks. I don't think a lot of fans... It doesn't hurt as much as if we were losing to a Bath or a Gloucester or an Exeter. I just think there's more meaning to those games. Um, you know, I, how many fans could actually tell you where the Sharks are from, where are the Lions from? Let alone, you know, it means something if you win or lose against them. Um, the fact that I saw the other day that they put up a tweet that they travelled eight thousand miles to play in South Africa yeah. this week, you just think what. Like, how's that been signed off? You know, it's uh, especially in this in this world where we're obsessed with, you know, climate change, et cetera, and being green. Um, but I just think what we need to do, and a couple of years ago, I understand when people said, when you go knocking on the premiership's door, they'll just tell you to go away because they don't need yeah. you. Whereas now, I think the premiership have been brought down a peg or two massively. Um, and I think now that the Welsh regions, especially, and maybe even the Irish and, and, and the Scots, can knock that door with a bit more credibility and, and the English wanting them to knock that door a bit more as well. I think the challenge here with the Anglo English League is, is the clubs in the level below the Premiership. If yeah. if they started inviting in Welsh regions, I think the likes of Ealing and, and Cornish Pirates would uh, would lose their collective minds, basically, and there would be a huge legal challenge. You know, The, the only real yeah. solution... Is some form of of combination of the English and the URC because the South African clubs need the URC to work because they yeah. don't have they don't have an option you know they can't they couldn't uh, play in the Pacific so they need the URC to so I understand it you know, I remember going to watch uh, in kind of Ebervale versus uh, the English clubs on a Wednesday night at home and you know just being a fantastic and. Uh, Atmosphere. Whether that happens again is another thing entirely. Yeah, and I, like I said, it's just about you know. There's a reason why the stadium has twice the amount of people in it when you're playing uh, a, a Welsh region. It's because it means more to fans. Um, you know, you need to you need to make games more meaningful. And I really believe playing clubs like the English clubs would do that. And you know, I've seen the the the, the thought process of maybe a, a two division sort of Anglo Welsh Scottish Irish league again. Not not a bad not a bad choice, but I just don't see how the URC can work. I just don't see the enthusiasm for it from fans anymore. Uh, to be perfectly honest, because speaking to fans that I would have classed as diehard fans back when I was playing, just just don't go anymore. They they just don't feel dragged down to Rodney Parade. Any need to go down there, and I, I, I again, that's for me is because they don't feel like there's much in the games anymore for them, especially with relegation as well. Of course, it takes the gloss off it. Yeah, that's interesting you say that, Adam, because um, there was a report in the Daily Telegraph last month. So a British and Irish Super League plan is being discussed uh, mm -hmm. with the unions and the clubs. Um, and it could it says it could include South Africa at least. So you think a British and Irish Super League, that's the way forward then? That's what you would like to see? Uh, I, yeah, I really do. You know, because the say the, the reason they go the fans turn up to see the the derbies is because they it, it, you know they're the ones that then go to work the following week and they can have a bit of banter with friends who you know it means more to them it's not because of the quality of player because if if fans were just uh, you know they were dragged down to Rodney Prey due to the quality of player then it would be packed for Leinster it would be packed for Ulster it would be packed for Munster but it's not um mm. you know it, it's just for those meaningful games yeah. so 
I I think that Super League would be a good good step in the right direction. Is that do you think there's a degree though, Adam, that people don't particularly want to see a poor dragon side getting absolutely slippered by, you know, a length to second fifteen? That's going to keep people away as well, isn't it? You know, it's uh... yeah, and that, and I think that that's something that that over time has has, has taken effect more more than anything, isn't mm -hmm. it? You know, people, you know, okay, we'll give you a second chance, a third chance, a fourth chance, you know. But as the years have gone on, they'd be like, yeah, uh -huh. this is this isn't going to change now. So they they also just don't go, uh, which, which is a big shame. Right, so you know one of these people on social media, Adam, is uh, URC equals best league. I don't know if you've seen that. That's like a trending uh, thing. Absolutely <laughs> You're not, not in no. that club, though. No? <laughs> no, absolutely, absolutely not. It's mainly no. Irish fans, to be fair, who love the URC yeah. best league. Well, of course they do, because they win it every year. So I wouldn't win it. Um, yeah. But, um, yeah, I, I, I don't feel that we have a, a moral obligation to keep South African rugby afloat either. I don't think we should forego the success of our club rugby just so the South Africans have something to play in. I do, uh, yeah, I do agree with you, but it's a huge market, isn't it? And I think yeah. the assumption is that we can you know, we can tap into that market. I think the idea that Welsh clubs will benefit from us tapping into a South African market is naive, but you know, rugby isn't the most uh, hard-nosed sport when it comes to business decisions. No, 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 and, and that, yeah, again, that, that's where it, that's where it does struggle. But you know, we've got somebody now in charge of the dragons who is incredibly business minded. Mm -hmm. You know, to be fair to, to, to Buttress, he's not rushed into anything. He's he's come in and he's done things slowly. He's done things the right way. Um, it's, I tell you, I, it was great to see how good Rodney Parade looks now uh, with all the yeah. improvements. You know, God, I I remember we played Glasgow. It wasn't the, the sixty pointer. It was a different game. Um, and, um, <laughs> yeah. we, we we had an email the night before to say something like they put fifteen tons of sand on the pitch. Please bring please like bring as much Vaseline as you can for your for your knees and your elbows. And I remember being on the wing, and it was up to your ankles. It really yeah. was that pitch back then. You couldn't run on that. Oh, yeah. um, so to see what it's like now is is brilliant. It was a terrible pitch, you know. It's I I play grassroots rugby on some awful pitches, but there are times when Rodney Parade are worse than some of the pitches I've played on. Yeah, it was it was awful. And you know, as an outside back, is what were you meant to do? You try and sidestep, just fall yes. over. You know, it it was uh, a yeah. tough work. I was just trying to think, was you involved in that game against Newcastle in the LV Cup? I don't know if you was at the club then, where it was basically yeah, I, flooded. I, you, I did you play in that game? I was captain oh, was you? <laughs> yeah, I was, I, was, I was going to the ref at the, for the game. Are you sure you want to go out there? Because this ref, I think it was his first top-level game, and um, yeah. he was he was keen as mustard to play, and me and the Newcastle captain <laughs> going... We don't want to go out there, do we? And we kept seeing ref puddles <laughs> over there, like pointing out all the puddles. He was like, "You want to have any of it?" He wanted, you know, he wanted to keep playing. And I remember he got called off, didn't it? It, so, it got abandoned half time, yeah, didn't it? Or just bit, after? Yeah, yeah. That was <laughs> so it was. It was just that was crazy. Why we played <laughs> that game, but uh, again, a, a good experience and a good memory. So. Yeah, something to look back on and have a laugh about now, isn't it? Yeah. But the, the pitch is much, much better, isn't it? Nowadays, oh, it's like carpet now, fairness. isn't it? You know, it, it yeah. really is one of the best. And um, the 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 groundsmen back in the day, God, they used to work hard to try and just get games on. Um, but it's uh, you know they got they got the facilities to do it now. Well, when you played uh, kind of youth rugby, Adam, did you ever play up a treble in the uh, in the Grand Valleys? I don't think I did. Do no, I, no, I, I don't. Singularly the worst pitch I've ever seen in my life. I just want to play. No, I used to ah. uh, the King's Head in Cambran could be a bad one back in the day. Oh yeah, that was grim. Yeah. <laughs> yes. uh, so that was a difficult one, but yeah, God, they were the days when your parents used to drive you around trying to find every Valley rugby pitch in, <laughs> you know, in the Gwent and Rhondda Valleys. But yeah, very different now. So. Doing your time at the Dragons, Adam, what stands out for you the most? Or what particular highlights do, do you have? Any particular matches that, uh, that stays with um, you? So I remember, of course, everyone will remember their debuts. Um, coming on, I think we played Cardiff at home was my was my debut at yes. Rugby Pro. And that, that was, was great. Cardiff, yeah. yeah, that was it. I, I, um, the very first touch of the ball for the Dragons, I just about to score in the corner. I think it was, is it Molotika literally 
took my head off. Like if if we were playing today, <laughs> he'd, he'd be banned for like a year. Yeah. Right? yeah. <laughs> if we did that, um, um, and that was my first touch, but that was in front of the old Argus Terrace, which was which was brilliant. The yes, place. you know, great atmosphere yeah. in there. Um, of course, we had our we had our, our run in Europe, beating Gloucester up in oh, up in yes. King's Home. Yeah, you know that was of course a massive memory because we went up there as such underdogs. We really did. Yeah, um, and it, everyone just pulled it out and put in a great performance and. Led to a good night out uh, in Bristol that day, and then we had the following week Montpellier in the semi, wasn't it? Um, yeah, that's which right. Was a real good experience, but probably one of my most fondest memories was my one of my very first games. We played Toulouse away back when they were, you know, the the real kings of of, of rugby, and Paul mm. Turner me at thirteen opposite Clement Patrono, just as he'd won Six Nations Player of the Year. I was thinking, oh god, here we go. Um, you know, it was a, <laughs> it was an experience to, as a real youngster to um, to go and play into a, a cauldron like that in a European Heineken Cup uh, was something that I'll probably never forget. Oh, brilliant, lovely stuff. Okay, so moving on then. Um, in April twenty. 20- And that was because of two major trauma scars that you sustained on your brain. Um, that must have been absolutely devastating hearing that news. Alan, can you just tell us about that that day that like, when the neurologist told you the news? I mean, it must have been one hell of a shock. Or did, was you kind of yeah. expecting? Well, it, it, it's it's a strange one. So I did suffer an, an awful lot of head injuries throughout my career. Um, and I've always said about concussions is that it's a snowball effect type injury is your first uh, and you all I had to do was just make a tackle and it, it you were seeing stars as such uh, so I came back from the Chiefs where I had really struggled and spent a long time out and in that first season when I came back for my second stint I think I played about 26, 27 games in a row. And I'm thinking, hang on a second, I, I can do this again. And then it was pre-season. The following year, I got knocked out really badly by Josh Navidi's knee in pre-season. Really bad knockout. Mm-hmm. And um, that took me a long time to come from. And it was during that period of about six months recovery. where I hadn't said it to anyone else, but I said it to myself. This happens again. I've, I've got to step aside. I just can't do this anymore. So I remember it was a game we played Ulster away when Bernard Jackman had taken over. And um, I took a heavy knock in that game into the head and I just I just didn't feel with it. And I said I said to the physios, look, I've got to come off. I, 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 I'm really struggling here. And I walked off that pitch, Ulster away, knowing that I'd never step on a rugby pitch again. I, I'd made that decision uh, almost pre-getting the injury that, it was going to be the last one, so it was. It was just a a normal Friday night. We like we'd lost quite heavily. I walked off the pitch in the second half, and knowing that I'd never do it again, you know, and, it, and that was quite a difficult wow. thing to process. But I'd already because I'd yeah. made the decision. I was comfortable with it as well at the same time. Do you think, as a game, Adam, that rugby takes uh, head injuries and concussions seriously enough? I think they're making the right noises now to say that they are. Where I really get frustrated with the governing bodies is they are they're like they're trying their hardest to make rule changes and, and make protocols and to make the game safer. But on the other side, they're just trying to deny that there's any link at the same time. You're trying to you you're just trying to think, well, hang on a second. So do you really believe this is an issue? Because the amount of rule changes and refereeing changes and everything you're making tell us you are, but then you're trying to release investigations and research to us to tell us that there's no link at all at the same time. So which which one is it? Um, you you've got you you've got to commit to one. So what I always say is, the NFL, for example, they 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 they, they succumb to the pressure of uh, concussion and contact sports back in early 2010s, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, if the NFL, one of the most powerful organizations on the planet, can't prove themselves that there's no link, can't fight it, why do why do rugby think they can? 
um, 10 years later. That, that's what I don't understand is if anybody, if there's anyone out there with the money and the finance and the power and the ability to prove something, it's the NFL. Oh, um, yeah, and, and the and people they used. Oh, to, you know, yeah. they, they, they've got the top trauma specialists in the world, your head trauma specialists yeah. in the world looking at it. So do you think as well, though, there's, there's a culture amongst fans, and it's not all fans, but a culture among fans that is, oh, it's a man's game, just get on with it, that kind of, uh, you know, you st- I still hear that, you know, kind of, is that holding it back as well? Do people need to understand, yeah, it is a man's game, but it's also people's livelihood. Yeah, oh, th- th- that's one of the most frustrating comments. And it, th- that wasn't just a fan thing. That was a team, a player, and a coach problem going mm. back 10 years ago. You know, boys getting knocked out on the pitch used to be cut. The video would be cut, and then the, you, you'd have a laugh on the Monday and the Tuesday, you know, because it wasn't seen as, as a serious injury because the governing bodies, even though they had the research decades before, had never released that information to the players to know. Um, so... Yeah, when when you hear fans say, "Oh, you know, don't play rugby then because you know you're going to get hurt." Look, if I break my leg, I've snapped my arm, I've broken my fingers, I've broken my nose. I don't mind that. That's what I signed up for. I didn't sign up to get an injury that's going to progressively get worse for the rest of my life. And I don't think anybody who plays rugby oh, ever did. Oh. No, uh, it's that, that, that's the difference. Yeah, it's that kind of let the boys play attitude. Yeah, is missing the whole point, isn't it? You know, everybody signed up to the game knowing exactly the level of risk they put themselves in. But yeah. but nobody wants, you know, no one wants to be in the situation you found yourself where Alex Popham finds himself, you know, it's... Uh, and, and that's what yeah. you're asking, and this is the big issue we got now, is as long as players and coaches, you're as informed as, as modern science allows, so you can be fully told, look, when you step on the pitch, this is the risk you're taking, then it's up to the player, I get that. But the issue was, is the research was there, but the governing bodies never educated players coaches physios and doctors of of the 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 issues we had so players weren't able to make an, an informed decision and that's what this basically comes down to mm-hmm. is yes players yeah. is up to players whether they play but you're not giving them the information that they require to make an informed decision uh, and i think this is what it all boils down to now because the year that the nfl decided yeah do you know what it's quite clear cut now that there's a big link between the two World Rugby completely flipped it on his head and changed concussion from three weeks down to five to six days, you know, turnaround, which meant that you could, as a rugby player, you could get concussed every week and still play. So you think, mm. what happened there? There was a serious breakdown in communication at that point. Yeah, one of the most frustrating comments I see is really annoying when you see people say, well, players knew what they were getting involved in, you know, they signed up to it and thinking... I don't think any player signed up for early onset dementia, did they? Sure. You no, know, no. sorry, it's a ridiculous comment, but you see it quite a lot on social media. Yeah, oh, it, it, it's like, like I say, we all we all signed up for 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 rugby, knowing that we could break every bone in our body, we could tear every tendon off 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 the bone. You know, the, the most horrendous type injuries that you can see, but the the invisible injury, the concussion, nobody signed up for that. No. They really didn't. No, no, not at all. Because your ambition outside of rugby was to become a pilot, wasn't it? Am I correct? Yeah. You did have a pilot's, la- pilot's license, but unfortunately, you had to give that up, didn't you, as a result of? Uh... Yeah, you know, you, you would have looked at my uh, medical file after I finished playing, and you wouldn't have let me anywhere near the controls uh, of an aircraft. Sadly, um, just just due to the amount of repeated concussions and the issues I had mm-hmm. um, around that, really, because it was, you know, it, I did really badly struggle uh, behind the scenes yeah. with, with my concussions as well. And in terms of your own health now then, Adam, do you still suffer from any sort of side effects, any symptoms since you've yeah, retired? You, you just you you learn to adapt really to what it is you can and can't do. So you have those initial few years when you retire where you're trying to learn, right? My body's been absolutely battered for the last 15 years. What 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 mm. what impact has that had? Um and you just learn over those few years, right? I'll do something, yeah, body doesn't want to do that. Um, and for me, it's it's movement. I, I can't really do anything that involves a lot of a lot of movement. So eye and head movement, for example, um, flying, you know, that was something that really, really caused me issues with sickness. Uh, and you just learn to adapt then uh, to the things that your body kind of can't do and and your memory. So you just you're, you're a lot more efficient on making notes to remind you of things. And, and these are the things that you, you get used to as you get older and the more 
time that has passed since you retired, really. It, the, the thing is, Adam, I think you're dealing with it, you know, remarkably, but it's also yeah. really depressing that you're saying that, you know, you're you're considerably younger than me and you're talking about having to manage your memory, you know, it's... Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, and that's what rugby has to think about. It it's not you know it has to think about that you're saying that at your age. It's it's just not right and normal. No, no, you're right. And you no, know, I I do speak to uh, you know these guys like Steve Thompson, um, who are obviously quite a bit older than me, uh, but mm. like really really struggling. You know, in that in just yeah. day to day life in general, and uh, and yeah. the, you look at the numbers involved now, and uh, it really does open it up, doesn't it? Because I saw, and I think it wasn't a case of what the research said; it was how it was worded by World Rugby that they that this new research has said that rugby was as dangerous as general exercise. And you're like, oh, come on, like, no. if I if I if you opened up somebody who jogs the streets brain in fifty years time, it ain't going to be the same as the professional rugby players. No. I don't need to no. be a scientist to tell you that. Um, you know, and it's just it's silly things like that silly statements which then loses world rugby its credibility when it comes to the action they're, they're taking on head injuries i i kind of I, I won't open this up to wider discussions about loads of other decisions that they base on science but world rugby aren't credible when it comes to making decisions they claim are based on science they pick no. very narrow fields in which to base the data they pick very narrow groups of experts and scientists they're picking from who are already on the the agenda they're pushing. You know, yeah. I don't think World Rugby, I don't think the WRU are credible when they claim they care about science. No, not at all. You know, and I think that's the exact reason why the concussion legal case has a number of ex World Rugby medical professionals and head of medicals on on, on it because they can they they knew what World Rugby were trying to do and they knew where they went wrong and what they were trying to hide. And they they want that to be to be well known. I think they want to be on the right side of history, which is fair enough. Yeah, I know you probably can't say too much, but are you still involved in that legal action against the WRU, RFU, and World Rugby? Because it was one of several names, wasn't it, that taken legal action? Yeah, that's it. So uh, you know, when it first started a couple of years ago, I was I was keen to to really spread the message, and I said, look, if there are media uh, interviews that need to be done, I'll do it. And mm. it was a shock. It was a few days of back-to-back -back interviews from me direct let's all over the world who had, who had really wanted to know about this yeah. case. It was a huge, incredible interest in it. Um, you know, and, and since then, I, I did say, look, I, I'll, I'll, I'll spread the word. I know I'll get the message out. But from then, I want to take more of a back, backward step because what I don't want to do is talk about concussion every single day. Because it starts to drag you down. I think you've yeah, got to try to think. You've got to put a positive. You know, try and think more positive, and hopefully that positivity yeah. will will will, yeah. will increase uh, any issues you have. Really. Um. So, it's still ongoing. It's going to be a very very slow burner, but in that time that it has started from the day it started to now, look at the changes that have come in. You know, and don't get me wrong, World Rugby have made mistakes in some of the changes they tried to make. But that's going to happen. It's new, isn't it? But they have, they are, they are being flexible. So um, you can see already the game's safer from the day they started the legal case, even to now. And it makes seem a bit of a strange. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Gav, go on. No, no, go on. I was just saying that's at least it's positive movement. The movement needs to be quicker and yeah. more, you know, more focused. But at least it's happening now. Yeah, and and the yeah, sad of reality of it is, and this is the sad reality of, of life in general, really, is unless it was finance that was brought into it they weren't going to make the change it's money yeah. that makes people change yeah um you know and with that the threat of financial action it, that's what gave them the kick sadly and that's unfortunately the only thing that ever works yeah mm. no you're 100 percent right it's, it's what uh it's what got the nfl off its bum didn't it because it was all those class uh class action suits that were being held against the nfl yes oh exactly you know i i i was uh, very very eye opening um and and really gives you an idea of of, of the issues that players face currently facing in in contact sport because hmm. i was going to ask it might seem a slightly strange question but when you watch a game of rugby now on tv just part of you think 
oh, I wish I was there now, running onto the field of Rodney Pre- Do you miss it at all, Adam? I know you've been through a lot, but do, do, do you miss it? Or are you just thinking, oh, I am glad to be a when, when, now? You know? Yeah, when, when people ask me, I always say, look, I, I, don't, I don't miss playing rugby, but the only thing I miss is that initial um, turn up the stadium and running out in front of a big crowd. There's... There's there's a lot of things that you can you can recreate from from your rugby days when it, whether it's uh, socially with the boys you know you, I, there's other sports I play now um, you know but the one thing you can never ever recreate in life no matter how much money you got is running onto that pitch in front of a big crowd home fans who are who you know who are desperate for you to be successful as a team you know that's a feeling and a buzz that you you, you can't get from anything else and that that is the one thing I do miss. No, I yeah I kind of. I'm 50 this week and I still play because I, I can't imagine what it's not like to have that camaraderie, you know, and it doesn't have to be rugby. But I think no. once you've had that team bag, isn't it? You know, kind of you want to be around other fellas, you want to be oh, yeah. claiming you're yeah. the greatest in the world or whatever sport you're playing, you know, and it's a difficult yeah. thing to give up. Oh, it is, yeah. And I you know, I, I play a lot of cricket now in the summer. Um, you know, only like Cardiff midweek stuff, but again, that it, it's great fun. It's great fun as a team. Um, and I, I actually did some refereeing as well when when I when I just finished playing, uh, which was uh interesting. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I referee at the tens. That's bad enough. Yeah, the idea of refereeing well, adults does not appeal. Yeah. So I I did that for a little bit, and the reason I wanted to do it, I thought I, I need something to keep me fit here. Um, otherwise, I'm going to yeah. lose that quite quickly. Um, but yeah, it was like anything sent right down to the bottom levels and work your way up. And uh, yeah, it was, I saw some things I didn't thought uh, went on back then. That's for sure. Do you get any abuse, Adam? Uh, a lot less than what most refs would get. You know, I, I, mm. I'd always hope, that somebody would turn around and say, oh, how, how is the Dragons or how's your head? Because I knew then I would get a little bit more respect, just, just a bit of credibility because because I played and they were a lot more respectful yeah. um, and that they, they sort of trusted your decision-making more, um, which, which helped an awful lot with, with the referee. And, uh, you know, when it, when it comes to the scrums, I think I did what every ref does. <laughs> as a forward basically in the scrimmage if you throw it all the rack if you throw your arm up one direction or other way you'll be yeah. right because yeah. someone oh, yeah. will be doing something wrong exactly, exactly yeah <laughs> you're gonna put your arm up either way and see which one gets the most booze and then you put the, you put the other one up so yeah that was um yeah that was and in in inter- I always used to ask like the boys who played in the front row, what what do I do here? And they they know as much as the ref. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. well, a, a, a lot of the stuff that's get penalised, you can't see because you're too busy trying to remove your head from someone's armpit. Yeah, exactly. So it's uh, a, an interesting part of the game, especially for a winger with a with a whistle. Oh, great stuff. So in terms of where you're up to these days, um, Adam, I understand you're a financial advisor. Do you want to tell us that's a little it. bit more about that? Yeah, so I've got my own company now that I set up uh, just nearly three years ago. And initially, and, and I still got a lot of the rugby guys, I, I help look after them, um, really enjoy that um, from, from Bristol Exeter and the Dragons. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's something that, yes, pilot was one that I wanted to do first, um, but yeah. my, my, my parents were financial advisors. I knew a lot about it. I did all my exams when I played. Uh, and went straight into that. Then when I finished, and I, I, I genuinely really, really enjoy the job I do now, which is just helping people out. Don't get me wrong; if the world was uh, a smoother place, the job would be a bit easier, but it's not. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's definitely a challenge, but really, really good fun. Just getting out and speaking to people and meeting people is is a is a huge, uh, say, positive of the job really. That's good. It's nice to be in a job that you enjoy, isn't it? Because, you know, not many yeah. people are in jobs they actually do enjoy. So that's no. uh, that's a positive. Just to end it then, I know you didn't see the game live because it was in Sweden, but you did see the highlights of Dragons against Ospreys. Yeah. First win of the season. Uh, what have you made of it, uh, Nano? Because it has been a difficult start for the Dragons. We knew it would be um, some missed opportunities, but a much needed win against the Ospreys, wasn't it? Yeah, so... I went to Rodney Parade a couple of weeks ago for the first time in years to watch the Blues game. 
Oh, uh, it's awful, uh, <laughs> isn't it? The atmosphere, <laughs> everything. It was oh, the worst honestly, game I, of Arnie Parade I've ever been through. It's awful. I, I, I sat in that stadium going, what on earth is happening here? Because we, I remember <laughs> I went to the pod about half an hour before kickoff. There was no rugby fans there. I, I, I walked, as I was walking into Rodney Parade about 10 minutes before kickoff, there was nobody else there. I was thinking, yeah. you wouldn't, there was a game on it. This is the Blues. It was so flat. It, it was, was so crazy. flat, wasn't it? No atmosphere. You know, it, yeah. It, it, for hours before kickoff, it'd be bouncing years a couple of years yeah. ago, and um, the game didn't give any sort of credit to the um, the occasion at all either, did it? It no, was a it did not poor, at all. poor game of rugby. So walking away from there, I was pretty flat about where the dragons currently are, mm. uh, you know, and Welsh rugby in general, really. Um, but to see that win then on the, on the weekend and and. See the crowd were really. Yeah, you could you could hear the crowd really starting to get back into it, and the players were absolutely yeah. buzzing because I don't think there's, it can't be a coaching team out there with Di Flan and Matt O'Brien that anybody wants to be successful more than them. You know, yeah. you're talking about the top top guys there. You know, local guys, Welsh 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 coaches come through the system. Players absolutely love them. I've never heard a bad word. About those coaches, even even considering the results, and that that always happens, is that players get upset with coaches. But I've not heard a bad word, uh, and I think everyone is collectively just desperate for that success. And let's hope that the weekend was was something that they can kick on with. You know, don't get me wrong; it's it's not an easy follow up going straight to South Africa. But I think regardless nope. of the results over the next few weeks, you can't even beg the question about bringing in a, a new coach and or a new coaching team because you're never going to you're never going to replace because who on earth would you bring in you know you've got a really good group of young coaches there you've got to stick with them um i believe over the next yeah. couple of seasons i really do because uh they've got a good good squad they got some good coaches um the other regions have almost been brought back down to the dragons level if anything <laughs> to make it more competitive so um, yeah, it was great to see that result, um, and also a convincing result against the Ospreys, which is nice. Um, and hopefully they can kick on for the rest of the season. No, I don't want to kick the Ospreys when they're down, but but <laughs> but okay. <laughs> do you think the I'll Ospreys? Do, do you think the Ospreys look very good, Adam? Because my take on watching that game was Ospreys looked very poor. Yeah, uh, um, yeah. No, don't don't get me wrong. I'm not saying the Osprey turned up and, and really turned it on. Um, I, I spoke to a few people that went, and they said it looked like the Osprey didn't want to be there. And this is not to discredit the Dragons' performance oh. play, uh, but it, it looked like especially their star players were just going through the motions, which which really surprised me uh, yeah. that they would do that. But at the end of the day, you can only beat what's in front of you, and they beat them Absolutely. convincingly. Oh yeah, yeah. But, but again, but that's what I mean about well, these Welsh derbies. A few years ago, players would be itching to get at each other. Whereas, if it is true that the Ospreys just didn't really look that bothered, that that's also a worrying sign. Mm. They may look a bit more bothered because they got the Osp- um the Scarlets this weekend. So go. uh, you'd like to think they would be a lot bothered about that game, wouldn't you? Yeah. You but think, uh, you look, think. if they don't turn up, if they're not bothered, that's their problem. I was, yeah, exactly. you know, we were, no, and, and, and that's what it's all about. Brilliant. Thank you so much for joining us, Adam. It's been a real pleasure. Um, it's been fantastic. Thank you so much. It's all right. Cheers, so, guys. um, no, the problem at all. Take care, and we'll speak yes. soon. Thank you very Take much, Adam. Time. Cheers. Bye now. There we go. That was Adam Hughes. That was an interesting chat, wasn't it, Gav? It was. Yeah, yeah. I'm really brave about the concussion stuff, and yeah. I've... And there will be people who listen to this poll to think, well, it is a man's game. You, but this, you know, we shouldn't be laying guys that low. No, absolutely. And he was a really good player for the Dragons. He was, mm. you know, we talked about um, a player like Adam Warren, for example. We always used to call like Mr. Reliable, Mr. Consistent. Well, Adam was definitely in that bracket. You know, oh, very versatile player, you know, whether it's full back, wing, or the centre. Very reliable play, really good um, for the Dragons. So I was pleased when he said he'd come on the pod and that I thought he was a really good guest. So we've had some very good guests on this pod, haven't we, in fact? We have. We've been very lucky. Indeed, we have. Right then, shall we talk about that win? Yes. <laughs> okay, so last Saturday, Dragons beat Ospreys 20 points to five. 
It was the Ospreys who opened the scoring first at the sixth minute through Matt Provero after collecting a chip kick from scrum half Ruben Morgan Williams. It's actually a well worked try, was thinking. Like, oh, yeah. It's not I, I thought that was a pretty good try from him, in fairness. Yeah, it was good um, awareness by only... Provero. You know, he, he, knew, he knew what he was looking for and he just he picked her up really kind of smoothly. He did. Um, but that was to be their only points of the game. Dragons responded through a penalty from Kai Evans. Then, again, Matt Provero saw a red card for smashing Will Reed of a head-high challenge. Kai Evans scored another penalty. And then a converted Bradley Roberts try put Dragons 13-5 at half, at half time. I did enjoy Bradley's try, but uh, yeah. the tackle attempt by Luke Morgan was... Um, well, it left something to be desired in there quite frankly, that tackle attempt. Do you really mean? Uh, the, second it, half was... he, he could have just waved him through almost like... It, it, <laughs> it, it... <laughs> I wouldn't have bothered. I'm still, <laughs> I'm still trying to find a point to Luke Morgan. I gotta be honest, because every time he comes down here, he never has a good game against us. No, no, uh, no. Well, I've never seen a good game full stop. But you know, I don't watch your <laughs> plays very often. He's all right, but he just never seems to have a good game when he's in Newport for some odd reason. So second half was one way traffic, and we were struggling to kill the game off. We had so many chances, yeah, yeah. we kept blowing them. It was really frustrating, but we clinched the win with a fantastic real diet try with 15 minutes left to go. When the Ospreys were down to 13 men, courtesy of Luke Morgan, yellow card, <laughs> and that was for a dangerous tackle on Rio Dyer. So the game finished 20 points to five. It was our first win at Ronnie Parade for 385 days, Gav. <laughs> That's it, is it? Just uh, silence. <laughs> so no, uh, so I, I'm going to go to the contentious issues. I'm going to ask you something. So uh, I'm in a group chat with some very noisy Ospreys fans. And, okay. uh, and when Prodero uh, was sent off, that was never a red, blah, blah. It, it, was, it, was. It, was, it was a stone cold red, wasn't it? Of course it was. He <laughs> smacked him straight in the head. There was yeah. no mitigation whatsoever. It happened and right I, in front of us. It was a clear red. And I was saying that in the group. I was saying, boys, you know, it's all right being one eyed, but, uh, you know, he's he, he's tackled him around his hairline there. You know, it's, it's not really what you should be doing. No. And what did you make of the yellow card? I mean, that was. Oh yeah, I'd, that was I'd definitely say. a yellow yeah, no, because if um, Richard Devar made the point on commentary, if he hadn't used his used his his arms to break his fall base, so he hadn't used his arms, Rio, he would have landed on his neck. Yeah, and that definitely would have been a red. It was stupid, wasn't it? Well, I, I think they mitigated it down, but like he was going to land on his head. Rio put his arms up to break his fall, so it was, oh yeah, but he didn't land on his neck. No, because Rio put his bloody arms out to prevent him landing on his head. Yeah, and lucky he did, because that, that would have been very nasty. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, if, if he hadn't done that. So what was your take on the game as a whole, then, Gav, the performance, and who, who stood out for you? Right, so, and I can't believe these words coming out of my mouth, considering how much we've wanted to win. We should have done much better. That, that wasn't a 15-point winning margin. That was a 25-30 point winning margin. We dominated the second half. We dominated the yards made, you know, Rio, Kai, just absolutely running the show. They offered nothing. And I said at the start no. of the season, I didn't think Ospreys were very good. And I, I stand by that. I don't think they're very good. If, if you're telling me, oh, they, they weren't up for it, that's their job. If if that's if that's what their performance is like, there's people in there shouldn't be playing for that team because that was a poor, poor performance. Yeah, we were good. I thought we played very well, you know, and uh, Rio should uh, stood out, Kai stood out, Bradley Roberts, who I've never been a big fan of, as you know, but I'm I'm starting mm -hmm. to see the point of Bradley Roberts, all really kind of stood out for me. Yeah, yeah so Kai Evans was player of the match and he was absolutely yeah. fantastic. And you know how much I love Kai Evans, so yeah. I'm really pleased about that, proving his doubt is wrong. Because I, I, I think he's a tidy player and I don't mm. understand some of the weird comments he gets. Whether you think he's international standard is another matter. Personally, I think he is, in my personal opinion. He just needs to be given more opportunities. But he's a very, very good player. His kicking game spot on. Um, and he was always dangerous at balling and he was great. I thought Rio Dai was sensational. Oh, yeah. Uh, for me, it could have been the player match could easily have been either Kai or Rio. He was brilliant, Rio. Every yeah. time he had the ball, he looked so dangerous. He ran rings around the Ospreys. 
he beat more defenders than any other player in the URC last weekend. You know, he beat the defenders. So he, he was just electric, wasn't he, Gav? And it's so good yeah. to see him now really kicking on, isn't it? I, I think what we did very well, and it's interesting because Adam kind of suggested our Paul Turner being at the club, we weren't mm. afraid to throw the ball about. We weren't afraid to be a bit more adventurous. I still think the decision making is poor. And I think it was probably Will Reed's best game for us, but yeah. still not a very good game, you know, in comparison to some of the others. And that decision making still isn't quite there. I'd, but I think what we did really well. So this is a, a team that, you know, kind of Osprey's fans are saying we're probably the strongest Welsh region. They offered absolutely nothing. And that was a good team they put out. Yeah, it absolutely yeah. was. I think a few shout outs for me was um I know you're not particularly keen on him, but I, I do like him, especially a lot. I thought George Knott was excellent coming off the bench because he had to come on after just 12 minutes, Ben Carter. I must say, I didn't mention this on Rab at the time, but I had to look back. Very naughty clear out by uh, Tom yeah. Offer because it was yeah. late. But as a result, now he's out injured, which I'll come back to. I wasn't happy about that. Um, and I didn't realise how bad he was until I watched it back today. Um, I thought he was really, really good off the bench, George Knott, putting he's the hell two, of a shift. Uh, last two games, he's been one of the better forwards for yeah. Knott. You know, he's he's really up in his work rate, he, you know. But once again, it's what happens if you select a second row in the second row. They get Absolutely. to do second they get to do second row things. Um another big takeaway from this game, something I never thought I'd say. We had the Osprey scrum on toast. And oh, I was very okay. critical of Rodri Jones last week. I felt he was very lucky he could have seen a yellow. He did not have a good scrummage and display against Leinster. My goodness, he made up for it last week because he he did a right down number on Tom Bofa. And that's very, very yeah. unusual to see Bofa get beaten like yeah. that. He Tom did really well, did he, Tom Bofa did a good scrummage. Uh, and you know, last week I talked about Rodri's bind and he just, it yeah. wasn't, it was, it was too long or it was too short and he wasn't getting enough stability. And I was watching it, and he, his bike was just exactly right, and he was tucking both of her in, and he was just, you know, kind of, he was controlling the drive. And and as a loose it that's quite tricky, because tight heads get to control that, because, you know, they have that, they can drive you outwards. But he wasn't, he was pushing both of her in. It was a really good performance by Rodri Jones. Absolutely. And Nicky Smith, someone who I'm a big fan of. Lloyd Faber, I've got a couple of penalties out mm-hmm. of him because you could see watching the stands, Nicky Smith was not driving straight. No. I said that to my dad at times, he's not efforts. driving straight. So, um, but, but I do like Nicky Smith, but on this occasion, he definitely wasn't he, driving straight. He doesn't straight, so. drive straight, though. He, he, he has a slight kink to his kind of the way mm. he sets, and it's always at a slight angle. Yeah, but um, I was really pleased with the scrum because we don't see such a strong oh. scrummage of performance. It did wane a little bit in the second half, especially when we made those replacements. Yeah, of course. But um, actually, I thought our scrum was a very big positive from that game. Well, it, and you talk about the Ospreys. It was a platform. Absolutely. Which and and you need a platform. Weeks. Yeah. No. You talk about the Ospreys. You are right. They offered absolutely nothing. I said that on Twitter. Well, now X after the game, I I thought they offered very little. Yeah, they scored a, a good try, but even before the you know people saying oh you know about the red card, we were in control even before oh, the yeah. red card. We were by far the best team, pretty much all game. How and many entries do you think Ospreys had in the Dragons twenty two all game? Uh, so I would say three, and I think I'm probably being. A little mean, but I don't think it was many. So, all game, the Ospreys had just four entries yeah. into the Dragons 22, which I is remember, credit I, to the Dragons. I can remember know. three, definitely, but yeah. Yeah, but uh, credit to the Dragons, I thought we did a really good job of keeping them in their own half, because in our second half, we were well on top. We butchered so many chances, and we, you know, a couple of wonky lineouts. Um, oh, we got to talk about that, and now you're no win. That one. Rio made a brilliant line break. He gives it to an Iron He's got you and Ross on the outside. And you're thinking it's going to be a certain try here. And the pass goes in the touch. Only on the one hand, you could say that maybe you and Ross should have cut in a little bit more. But that was the equivalent of a, an open goal that was missed. And, he, he's, you know, he's, a professional rugby, he's a professional rugby center. Ross could have come in a bit. But he's making he's he needs to be making that pass. 
You know, he needs yeah. to make... And, you know, and Nairn's a good passer of the ball. It's not like he's a bad passer of the ball. You know, I've played with centres who I'd rather didn't pass because they can't. But, you know, Nairn no Owen can pass. Yeah, and that was the biggest surprise for me because Nairn no Owen's distribution skills are right yeah. up there. They're, they're top draw. And um, it was really painful because, again, that happened right in front of us. And you're thinking, oh, my days. It was really frustrating. But so many opportunities. The attack isn't quite clicking Yet again, Gav, no. we're very clunky in me in, in attack. You know? it, there's a bit more ambition, but uh, you know the gap between ambition and uh, output isn't quite what it should be. Yeah, um, but look, you know, people were saying to me, "Oh, you know, they should have had the bonus point." Drivers should have put. Yes, they should have had the bonus Agreed. point. Yes, they should have put more points on the Ospreys. But what I would say was, we just had to get the win. We, yeah, we yeah. desperately needed a win. And first and foremost, we just had to get that win. Bonus points are what they are. They're just bonuses. Saturday was all about the result, and we got the result. So, um, yeah, I, I know it is frustrating, so we should have put them under the pump a little bit more, but I'm just pleased we won more than anything else. Oh, 100%. 100%. Now, there was another instant in this game um, regarding Ben Whitehouse and our conditioning coach, yes. uh, Dan Barr. I, I did you listen to the rap pod this week? Uh, I have not had a chance to listen to it yet. It's my dog walking on a Friday morning pod. Right. So I had a sort of an unpopular opinion about it. Um, I'm not defending Dal Danbar at all. You can't touch the referee, right? That's no. obvious. You cannot do that. And Dan's been in the game long enough now. He's been around the block. You you should know by now that you just can't touch. To be officials. fair, or to Danbar, right? And I'm not. Uh, defend him either, but he was a shit house as a player. He, he, yes. you know, he was... So, but my take on this because I didn't notice anything in the stadium at the time. I, I saw him talking to Ben White, but I didn't know this was this big bust up that they had. It's only when I looked on my phone after the game I saw Twitter a, a, a blow, a, you know, blew up. So I watched the game back when I got home. And look, you know, like I said, Dan Bar's completely in the wrong, and we'll talk about what's going to happen later on. My unpopular opinion was, though, I don't think Ben Whitehouse handled it as good as everyone says. Because what I didn't like no. was he handed it well up to a point and then it turned into the Ben Whitehouse show. So that bit where he's like, don't touch me, you know. And this man stays off the field from now on. He's to not come back on the field. I thought it was a little bit over dramatic, a little yeah. bit over the top. Like, you know, he's well within his rights to say, look, Dan, I'm not happy. You know, stay off the field. We'll talk about this later. I, I just felt it was a little bit but, too OTT. Did you agree with me, Gav, or my oh, no. minority? For no, no, I, I, you're right. Right. The, the the problem is with with Ben Whitehouse as a, a referee, as a he, it is a lot about him, and it's a, yes. it's a bit like the reverse of uh, there's a famous apocryphal story about W. G. Grace. He's playing at the Oval, and he's bowled out first ball. And he turns around, he picks his uh, st- bales up, puts them back on the stump, and the, the umpire's saying, well, you, you need to leave, Mr. Grace. And he said, no, no, these people have paid to see me bat, not to see you umpire. But with Ben Whitehouse, it's a bit like, no, boys, no one's coming here to see what you play. They've all come to watch me ref. Now leave me alone. Uh, and the, yeah. the, the dealing with the Dan Barr thing was an element of that, because he didn't need to be so histrionic. He just needed to say, that's yes. unacceptable. Please leave the field. I will speak to you later. I'm not going to ask you to come back on now, but you just need to leave the field. And then, you know, say to the, the captains, right, you need to control yourselves. Everyone needs to calm the hell down. And let's get on with it. But he amped it up by yes, the way he exactly. responded to... Because that yeah. ball was well out of the way, but he just needed to be... You know, I worked in schools with uh, children with challenging behaviour for many years. And if you ram stuff up, you end up getting a sharp end. So you would mm. always play them. Come on, lads. Let's sort this. You need to go away. I'll have a chat later. Not right now. Because you're not going to mm. sort anything out there and then. Yeah, and, no, Dan... and, and I'm glad you said that. Because, I, like I said, I said this on the rap pod. And it did feel like an unpopular opinion at the time. But when I watched it, like I said, I have no problem with what he said initially. He, and then no. when, he, when he started being a bit over dramatic about it, it, the tone he used... Yeah. I just thought it was unnecessary. And, you know, I don't want to quote uh, Sean Holly at the best of times, but he was right when he said minor scrum five. He said it became a pantomime. 
And it did feel like a bit of a yeah. pantomime when he started doing this, don't touch me, and all this stuff. Like, you know, it's... He, he ramped up the emotional tenor when yes. what he needed to be doing was bringing it right down. You know, it's... Uh... It was the right thing to tell Dan Bar to get off. It was the right thing to send my brother off. But you know, there's yeah. there's ways of dealing with that kind of behaviour. Yeah, absolutely. I thought it was just me. I'm glad you said that though. If, if the WRU that... want uh, advice on how to manage challenging behaviour, I am available at very reasonable cost. Yeah, I don't <laughs> think many people will agree with us, but that's my unpopular opinion. I've got another unpopular opinion. I think you're right. Gav. I use another unpopular opinion, Phil. Phil Collins' era Genesis was a million times better than P- Peter Gabriel's oh, era Genesis. God, I, I, what do you no, think I, of that? I, 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 yeah, well, I've enjoyed doing this pod with you, uh, Jamie, but uh, <laughs> sadly, sadly, it must come to an end because that's the most <laughs> insane thing any human being has ever said, ever. But once again, I'm not joking. I'm not joking. No, I'm I know you're not. I saw your uh, <laughs> I saw your Twitter comment recently, and uh, I, I was considering blocking you. <laughs> but, Honestly, I I love Phil Collins. You were I, That's all uh, I've been listening they're to. They're different maybe. bands. They're different bands. I think it's fair to say, Phil Collins either Genesis or a pop band with, with high yeah. levels of musicianship, whereas. Peter Gabriel era Genesis. I can't believe we're having this conversation on the Dragons podcast. Absolutely. Uh, Gabriel era Genesis is is a proper band for grown ups. You know, it's uh, it, it's not a pop band. It's an album band, and uh, you know, oh god, it, it's just. You know, <laughs> Are you asking you on this? <laughs> oh god. <laughs> How can we should compare... have this conversation another time. But I knew that was going to get you. How that, can man. you compare Invisible Touch to selling England by the pound? That's an, that's an act of madness. Oh, this <laughs> brilliant Genesis albums with Phil Collins. Brilliant <laughs> albums. Um, but look, that's my opinion. I'm standing by. I love Phil Collins' Eva Genesis. Right, uh, moving on. Um, sorry, do you want to just... Say something else now before we move on about the issue. Well, or... uh, where do you stand on Phil Collins' solo period? Oh, a pile of shite. I don't like Phil uh, Collins' solo stuff. I only like the Genesis, um, oh, okay. either Phil Collins. Well, to be fair, he did make some good tracks. I mean, Another Day in Paradise, <laughs> I Wish You Would Rain Down. And... No, don't you think so? No. <laughs> I No, he's a terrible tax dodging. Easy love a human, human being, no, no, terrible, <laughs> terrible. So, and I don't really like pop music, uh, Jamie. I, I, I haven't pop got rock. Any I prefer to call it. I yeah. prefer to call it pop rock. I, I haven't got, a, I haven't got any ear for pop music. But I think it's pop music. I'll say to my wife, I don't understand how that wasn't a hit, and she'll say, Yeah, Gav, because no one wants to listen to that. There's a song called Ubu by a band called Methyl Ethel, who I, I was convinced was going to be number one. And then no one listened yeah. to it about six, seven years later. Go, yeah, that's just really weird white boy funk. No one's going to be buying that in the millions. But it's great. Look, track. you need to you need to go back and listen to albums like Duke, Abercab, and the self titled Genesis album from nineteen eighty three, and even the nineteen ninety ones. We can't dance. It's a very, very good album. I know you won't have any intention of doing so, but they're very <laughs> underrated. Genesis uh, albums. I, right. I will I, not. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you would. Okay, so um, back to the game. And just to end, it was the highest attendance of the season of Ronnie Price. We had over 6,277, which is pretty decent, uh, I think. You know, nope. for, for us, you know, that's that's a pretty good crowd. And i got to say, the atmosphere was brilliant, Gav. This was by far the best atmosphere of the season, and Fair Play, there were quite a number of um, Ospreys good. fans. It looked good on Fair yes. Play, yeah, and it looked like they were Ospreys fans there. Yeah, I mean, most of them haven't come from Swansea, let's be honest, I, the Gwent Valley, so a lot of them. Yeah, I was going to say most of them have <laughs> come from Bloody Ever Vale, if my experience of watching Rugby and yes. Vale is anything to go by. There were loads of Ospreys fans in Gwent during that galactical period, when it was very cool and trendy to support the Ospreys, where they had, you know, Lee Byrne, Mike Phillips, James Hirk, Shane Williams... Even now, and all that lot. even now, if you go to the Weatherspoons in Ebervale, you know, if you would choose yeah. to do that, you'll see lots of our space tops. You very rarely see a dragon's top. No, absolutely. Right, okay then. So, yeah, it was a great evening and a great win. So, I'm um, very, very pleased about it. It's just nice to be able to talk about winners, Nick, oh, on this podcast. Because we have waited a fair while. 
Okay, then, shall we move on to the mailbox? Yes, let's do that. Let's have a look what's in the mailbox. So, Ian Banvey says, hope they can build on the victory now. It was good to see them attacking the backs a lot more on Saturday. I also think they should have more than one tent for supporters. We're talking about the marquee now, okay? They should have more than one tent for supporters. It was like a kid's playground in there on Saturday. Well, let me tell you, Ian, it's always like a kid's yeah, playground on there. Every match day, which is exactly why I never go in the marquee, because I hate it. I, you will always see me at Romney's bar. That's where I go. I, I don't like it because it's just full of kids running around the place. It's loud. It's noisy. Uh, it's not the place to go for, in my opinion, a pre-match bite, unless you have a child with you or your coach of rugby. When, when know, I went team. to county, the county game uh, earlier in the season, it's different. I went in there. Well, there's still kids running around, but I was with my lad, so it gave me yeah. a chance to have a beer, and he got to bounce on a bouncy castle. But, you know, if I wasn't with him, I wouldn't have been interested. But, you know, I got a season ticket for both County and Dragon, so yeah. they said, you know, I don't mind going in the marquee on a county match day because it's less noisy and chaotic in the, yeah. in the tent, and they have, like, live bands and stuff. But the, yeah, I, I don't go in the tent for a Dragon's match day. I always go in Ronnie's bar or McCann's or the Moringer if I don't feel like... Um, you know, going into Ronnie's bar. So, uh, yeah, I, I avoid the tent uh, unless you got a child with you is uh, my advice. Dave Ashton says, do you think Paul Turner could use his connections to find us a good defence coach? I mean, he is well connected, isn't he? Oh, absolutely. Been around the game a long time. Mm. So, uh, it, it'd be interesting to see. The at the moment, we got it's... Sam Hobbs, isn't it, doing the defensive role. But that's a part-time sort of thing. It's no connection, though. It's that, isn't it, you know? It, you've got to, if you want someone who's decent, you've got to pay for it. Yeah, yeah, it's fair enough. Um, good coaches, they uh, don't come cheap, do they? No. So Daniel Green said, "Good win. We kept up the pressure and didn't just go back into bad habits." Andrew Turner says, "The boys gave the fans something to cheer. Great atmosphere by us, even with Osprey's fans around us. But uh, it was a very good atmosphere. I, I thought it was uh, one of the best I've been to recently." Delmi says, great win with some young homegrown talent on display. Excellent win. Excellent day. Wiggy says, well done, Dragons. And Kevin says, that should now be looking at Bradley Roberts. I mean, I will say that uh, I know you're not a big fan of Bradley. I love Bradley. And I, he I think he's played very game. well. He's played very well this season, yeah. Well, he, out, he outplayed his opposite number, do we like? Oh, big he time. Did. He was much better. Right, so, but it's um, interesting I, with the I, Ospreys, I'm... though, isn't it? I'm going to say something now, and, and Josh Gardner of Blood and Mud is going to feel a, a, a <laughs> kind of a, 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 a shadow in the force. He's going to feel that something terrible has happened with what I'm about to say, as will uh, Robbie, who does squid rugby. I James from the Ospreys I yeah, podcast. I Go on, let's just name all the Ospreys fans we yeah. know <laughs> and upset I them. I don't think Dewey Lake is that good. Oh, Dav, you're upsetting me now, say you that. <laughs> I like I him, don't you? Like, he's not as good oh, as Ryan Elias. He's not as good as Elliot. He's a he's a big That's an unpopular lad. opinion. Yeah, I don't care. It's, <laughs> it's, it's still not offensive as talking about Phil Collins. He's, he's, <laughs> no, I, I'm going to reframe it. He is good. He isn't as good as people would suggest he is. I think there are better hookers in Wales currently. Okay, but. Um... I was going to say, what was interesting in the Ospreys, so you were right, they come down, you know, they're fully loaded. They always have good squads when they come to Newport. Mm. And this is why this is my favourite derby, because they they usually come a cropper, didn't they? Even in the Galacticos era, they used to come to Ronnie Parade and they'd leave with their tails between their legs. Um, there's so many of their big-name players, though, just didn't turn up. I mean, we talked about on the rap pod, George North was anonymous. Mm. He was absolutely anonymous. You wouldn't even know when he was playing. I, I forgot North. he was there at one point. Yeah, I, I was watching the game. And, oh yeah, he's playing. Oh yeah, <laughs> he, he did pretty much nothing, you know. Yeah. And uh, a lot of their big name players just didn't. Um, they didn't perform. But like I said, it'd be a different story from uh, this weekend because they got Scarlets at home. So uh, you you watch, they'll be a much much better team. But um, yeah, yeah we were Scarlet's just look very good either. Oh no, they don't. They don't at all. But uh, I, I just think Welsh rugby in general, Gav, you know, are any of us looking good at the moment? Are any of our teams really looking good? It's, it's a race to the bottom, isn't it? I know that sounds yeah. depressing, but to me, yeah. it is a race to the bottom. A, the a group of bold men fighting over a comb is the, uh, <laughs> you know, the kind of the Welsh hubcap race, isn't it? You know, it's. Uh... Yeah. Okay, then. So that's the mailbox done. Let's move on to some news. We've got a couple of bits of news. So 
Bad news, I'm afraid. Ben Carter will be out until at least March after suffering a severe hamstring injury for the Dragons against the Ospreys. That means he's also going to miss the Six Nations. So, um, yeah, I mean, Wales do have decent depth yeah. at lock. It's it's going to hurt us more than Wales, but uh, yeah, it's really I, I don't disappointing think... news, Gav, isn't it? Yeah, I, you know, I, I don't think Ben Carter was troubling the Welsh squad, but... He, he Not for a start, be, no. No, but he would be our first choice second row, probably, wouldn't he? Yeah, I mean, we have got good options. You know, yeah, we still got like so Matthew Screech, Joe Davis, George Knott, Sean Lawrence. There we got youngsters yeah. and Ryan Woodman and Barney Langton Cryer, which I'm still convinced is a made up name. Um, but yeah, we, we got Barney some Langton options. Barney Langton Cryer is now a rugby player. He, you know, he's a Deaton. <laughs> Barney Langton yeah. Cryer is a Deaton. He plays a bit of cricket. He, he, he <laughs> learned to work for the Foreign Office. <laughs> yeah, so that's really disappointing news uh, about Ben Carter, and we wish him a very speedy recovery. The other bit of news, well, we've already touched on it, but um, Dragons have taken, well, understandably so, they've taken a head of performance down bar off Waterboy duties for Saturday's game with the Sharks after his spat with referee Ben Whitehouse. So Dave Flanagan said today that Dan is well aware you can't do what he did, and we are dealing with it in house. There is a consequence agreed by Dan and us. You can't do that. It's as clear as day. Yeah, it's as clear as day. My end. Dan and Ben go back a long way, and he phoned him on Monday. Dan was Ben's strength and conditioning coach when he worked for periods at the WRU. So they've obviously got a relationship. Yeah. They know each other. Um, he, he called him up on Monday, so they probably saw the things out. Now, there's no official action yet from the URC, but the Dragons are taking the initiative of you know Chris Curran reported as a ban, but they they basically you know they are banning him from Waterboy duties and you'd be sitting up in the stands so um, whether you ask you take official action or not, the Dragons have which is yeah. fair enough isn't it Gav? Decisive, yeah, sensible and yeah, it's good that Dan Barr has rung Ben Whitehouse as well, you know, it's it's a grown up solution isn't it? Yeah, absolutely Okay then, uh, that's the news then Gwent Rugby Roundup Gav it was a big win for your boys wasn't it it, it was it was a fantastic game apparently as well according to my friends who uh, went to the game mm. uh, the Newport Stadium you know kind of biggest crowd you know, for that level of rugby uh, yeah. you know kind of uh, and a 28-20 win for Ebervale over Newport uh, Pontypool also kept up their uh, winning ways they beat Neef 24-12 so Premiership really tight. Uh, Slandavri at top, they've got 39 points. Newport then on 35. Pontypool on 34, but have played the game more than everyone else. And then Ebbvale on 34. And then there's a 10 point gap between Eb- the rest. So it's between those sides essentially to see who who wins. And they've won against each other. Pontypool re- beaten Ebbvale. Ebbvale have beaten uh, Newport. Ebbvale have beaten Slandavri. You know, there's there's that to and then throw in, and it's, it's quite competitive yeah. for Gwent sides in the Premiership. Of course, we don't know what's going to happen with the elite rugby, and kind of uh, Pontypool have said that they are interested in it. I haven't seen yeah. anything else definitive from any of the Gwent clubs, but they've not come out right and been negative like the Cardiff region clubs have. No, that's right. But yeah, you know, again, and it's interesting going back to when we talked to Tom a couple of weeks ago about the Leinster system. Yeah. You know, and until we realise that those players need to be schooled in a in a way of playing, it's it's not gonna have any impact whatsoever. No, absolutely not. We just gotta to continue to find a way to bridge that gap, yeah. have we, from semi pro to, to pro and um, but, there's no easy answers, is there? But also as well, you know, kind of not ignoring the quite posh elephant in the room with Leinster, most Leinster players have come through a school system. Yeah. I, I saw a, a, a ridiculous stat, and I'm probably entirely wrong, and Irish rugby Twitter will come after me, but it was something like, of the Leinster squad, not including players from overseas, they'd come from six schools. Yeah, there's that private school system, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, it works when, incredibly well for them. Rugby in Ireland is a is a school played in private school. It's, you know, you, yeah. you pay and fee pay in schools. You don't play it if you go to a comprehensive in uh, in Dublin because you play Gaelic sports and you play soccer. And it's on a decline in Welsh comprehensive schools, as per that oh. report uh, by BBC yeah. Wales. Hugely so, so because yeah. yeah, you know, kind of PE teachers aren't coming through playing rugby. I I always remember my PE teacher when someone asked if we could play football. He's well, boys, that's a sport for. Uh, 
Englishmen and girls, and I can't see any of you wearing a dress. <laughs> it's, uh, and right. that was the attitude. Well, you don't really, <laughs> you don't really get it that. Uh, you know, fortunately, you don't get that kind of misogyny, but you don't also get those attitudes uh, anymore no, either. Goodness. Yes. Uh, yeah. So, any other results? Oh, sorry, I've gone off on that hand of this. So, <laughs> champion, championship East, uh, Dragons Derby, Cross Keys beat Penalta 34 7. Uh, Newbridge, who were uh, second in the uh, Championship East, beat Bargoid 16 6. Big good winner, Bargoid, good side. And then Bedwest yeah. beat uh, Trioki 36 15 away from home. Uh, Cross Keys are fourth in the uh, champ- in the Championship East, Bedwas and Ninth from Penalta are just above the relegation. In Division One East, which is topped by your boy, your phone boys on SD, uh, they won the twi- they won twenty ten against St Genes. Pontypool United got uh, mauled at home by Nelson sixty six eight. Monmouth also lost heavily at home uh, six uh, thirty six. They lost to Bed Linog, and Blind Avon beat Dowler sixteen ten. Uh, Talawine the second and Brimo a third. Brimo are two points behind and have two games in hand. Lots of games uh, postponed due to weather. Abergavenny's game was postponed and Brimo's game yeah. was postponed on the weekend because, uh, speaking to my mother, it sounded a bit grim in the old Eastern Valleys. Hmm. Yes, that was quite weather. It wasn't very nice weather in some parts. And that decimate that decimated it lower down the leagues as well. The games were being played, you know, in Newport and yeah. further down, but up in the valleys, games were being called off left, right, and centre. Hmm. And, and yeah. everything from Division Three below was very little rugby happened over the weekend. Hmm. So is that it then, Gav, for the results yeah. wise? It is this brilliant. Week. Okay. Excellent. Thank you for that, Gav. So moving on, it's time to rate the players' playlist. So for those who are unaware, the Dragons are asking players to submit six songs to their pre-day, um, sorry, their pre-game playlist at Ronnie Parade. So they'll, they'll play a lot of music um, at Ronnie Parade before the game, you know, the players warm up on the field. They're asking a the player to choose six songs to go towards the pre-match playlist. So it was Matthew Screech's turn to choose six songs for the game against Ospreys. And I've got to be honest, Gav, this is an abomination, this playlist. <laughs> Strong words. Strong words, Amy. It's the playlist of a man who owns four CDs, two of which are, that's what I call Music 61. <laughs> so the first not, track... He's not heard music. That That's the only reason that I can imagine anyone would choose these songs. It's a really odd mix as well, and I, I'd only hear the two, well, two or three of these songs I heard. The others, I've listened to this playlist today, by the way, just to listen to the other tracks. So it's really not my cup of tea at all, some of these tracks. So the first track he chooses is Signs by Drake, which, um, you no, know, he's, he's pretty well known, Drake. He's massive. He and um, I couldn't name you a song of it, so off the top of the head. So um, I listened to this today, and it's not really match day music. It's, I thought it was... Have you heard it? Do you know the song? Right, uh, so it's very couple, chilled. So a couple of years ago, I did this mad thing where I decided I was going to listen to all 500 albums on the Rolling Stone 500 albums list in a year. Oh, I like to do that. I like to do that. <laughs> it drove me to bring sanity, but uh, yeah, I did that. Was he yellow on there? Was he yellow in the list? No, there was no yellow. <laughs> but they, but they were free Drake albums, so I've probably heard this Drake song. But my thing with Drake is that I can remember this at the time. I wrote a little blog to go with each one. I thought I don't understand how this man is so popular because <laughs> it, it was fine. It it was yeah, it was fine. <laughs> The ladies love him, though. Yeah, he's you know, a handsome man. With female he's, colleagues who love Drake. He's, you know. a, he's a handsome man, and the music is that, isn't it? It's, you know, like, that is that is music by a man who would definitely, you know, show you a good time. Yes. Uh, yes, he would. So, uh, yeah, I listened to the song. I knew it before. They thought, well, yeah, it's okay. It's fine. It's the kind of thing you hear on, like, Kiss you know, or, or Radio 1, but it, it didn't really do anything for me. I thought it was quite chilled really for it doesn't strike me as a, a game day anthem put it that way so um yeah that was uh drake with signs now the second choice i mean this was a blast for the past especially for me um he chose gangster's paradise by coolio 
So I was 11 years old when that got released. And I could tell you that I remember that song was massive. Oh, yeah. It was played everywhere. Every time you turned on the radio, it was on. You could not get away from that song. And to be fair, at the time, I liked it. I liked it a lot. Loads of kids loved this song. Do you know the song, uh, the samples based on the Stevie Wonder track? Pa- no, past- I've seen it's called Past Time Paradise. So the chorus is a direct lift. I can't remember which album might be talking picture, but I can't remember anyway. It's a direct okay. lift of the chorus. But instead of Gangster's Paradise, you said you spend all your life living in a past time paradise. It's a song about nostalgia. So <clears throat> I really like the... Uh, I, I really like that sample. So as much as I was 10 years older than you, so I just thought it was a bit of a novelty rap song. But mm. you know, it's fine, isn't it? It's it's a good pop song. Yeah, it is. Did you ever? Because I know you're a film buff as well. Because it's off a film called Dangerous Minds I... with Michelle Pfeiffer, and um, you know she's this teacher. She goes to work. Yes. It's really urban, rough. Have you seen the film? I have seen it. I have seen it. Is it any good? Because I've never seen it. Right. Uh, I'm going to give you. I'm going to go off on a tangent. If you want to watch a film like that, don't watch. Uh, Dangerous Minds, which is fine, but a bit Hollywoody. Watch a film called Stand and Deliver, which stars Edward James Olmos, which is about mm-hmm. a guy who teaches maths in a really tough, predominantly Mexican school in LA in the late seventies. Oh, okay, I'll have to check that without. Very, very <laughs> similar kind of idea, just really life affirming uh, story. Dangerous Minds is fine, you know. Yeah, because I never, I've never seen the film, and I remember the music video because it had Michelle Pfeiffer yes. in the music video it with Julio. Um, it was a big box of, box office hit, though. Um, the budget was twenty three million, and it took over one hundred eighty million. But uh, when you go on Wikipedia, it says the critical consensus on Rotten Tomato calls it rife with stereotypes. Oh yeah. <laughs> and that yeah. doesn't surprise me one bit. I haven't even seen the film, but already I'm getting that. Rife with stereotypes feel yeah, about it. Uh, uh, without having seen it, I reckon you could tell me what four of the characters are without even trying. Oh, okay. I'm not going to try now, but I could. I got a no. good idea in my mind of, of yeah. what what kind of characters are involved. Yeah. Try stand and deliver instead. Honestly, it's it's a great film. Right. That's on my watch list. Right, these next two tracks, again, oh, they're bloody awful. I just couldn't connect with these songs at all. So he chose Industry Baby by Lil Nas X and How Soon Is Now, in brackets, remix, David Guetta. It's nothing to do with the Smiths. It's, it's not a cover version uh, of the Smiths. I thought it was a Smiths cover. So when I saw the list, I thought, right, yeah. yes, how bad could this be? It's actually worse than if it had been a Smiths cover. <laughs> Are you a Lil Nas X uh, well, fan, Gav, at all? I, I, I am not, but my son is. Oh, right, okay. You know, so Matthew Screech yeah. is musical taste with a nine-year-old, which yeah. tells you what you need, <laughs> really. What What's the yeah. old, uh, old tone roads? I can play that on the guitar, because my son asked me, oh, can I play that on those two chords? So I just, I, I can, <laughs> I can uh, go between those two chords. I think oh, that's a bit of fun, old tone roads, but uh, industry babies, you know. Well, it's rap that appeals to nine-year-old boys. Yeah, it's it's not my cup of tea at all. I listened to it and I didn't like it. Uh, the David Greta track, I mean, that that's like the kind of track you, you were doing vibes in Newport at three o'clock in the morning when you're off your tits. It, yeah. It's our kind of track, isn't it? And, and we know and, what uh, vibes it's like, Gav, don't we? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Only in the day, though. We have not, me and no. just to confirm, me and Gav have not been clubbing at three o'clock in the morning in vibes in Newport. No, no. As my son proudly uh, pronounces to anyone, Dad took me to a nightclub in Newport. I'd like to point out <laughs> it was to watch a Wales England game, and it was about four, it was five in the afternoon. But uh, uh, that yeah. was a good afternoon, though. Oh, God, David Greta. I, 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 he is the king of music for people who don't like music. Oh, I'll just he's very David popular, isn't he? Well, of course he is, because there's no effort involved. No, you know, it's, anyone... it's just not my cup of tea. No, anyone could like it. It's nonsense. Now, the next two tracks um, I do quite like, especially the last one, but um, these are proper 90s classics, I would say. Ready or Not by the Fugees. That was a pretty big... I like the Fugees. They weren't bad, the Fugees. Oh, and I, I... the, the I, I, I Oasis like classic. You do, Sorry. yeah? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, go on. 
No, I was going to say, you know, Lauren Hill's first solo album, uh, The Miseducation of Lauren Hill. Oh, that's good. Uh, yeah. Oh, that's a great album. Very high on it the is. Rolling Stone 500 list. Yeah, Wycliffe Sean and that, wasn't it? Yeah, I, I, I like the Fugees. And then Wonder War by Oasis. That's a good track. You can't argue with that one, can you? It's, it's the worst Oasis track, but the worst Oasis track is better than most other bands, so, you know. I mean, I'm going to disagree with you with the fact it's the worst Oasis track. They've done far, far worse tracks. Oh, no, Wonder yeah, War, it's but, not. Uh... She's, she's Electric <laughs> is the worst Oasis track. Oh, I love that oh. one. <laughs> oh, it's a good song. It's good vocal by Liam. That's one of Liam's best vocals on that. If, oh, God. He goes really high-pitched on that one, doesn't he? You don't hear him normally go so high-pitched. Oh, it's great. It's, it's best vocal performance is Cigarettes and Alcohol, I think, but... Uh... Okay, that's another great track. So there we are then. So it's Science Drake, Gangster's Paradise Coolio, Industry Baby by Lil Nas X, How Soon Is Now, David Greta, Ready or Not Fuji's, Wonderwall by Oasis. So out to 10, I'm giving this a free. I'm giving it a free as well. Yeah, it's pretty shit, isn't it? Sorry, I'm... Matthew, if you're listening, but uh, that is not a good match day playlist. You that, need that to not... game, mate. That is not the music that second rows listen to before games. I say that as a second row. <laughs> you know, Matthew, if you want to get in touch with the pod, myself and Jamie will give you a, <laughs> a playlist of early to mid nineties metal that will really fire you up. You'll be back in the Welsh squad in seconds. Absolutely, yeah. I, like I said, I'm still waiting for like a dragon split to have like Ramstein and you know Anthrax or you know, well, Megadeth, you, Metallica on this. So when Sam Warburton was Lions captain the first time, he put a yeah, playlist I know he together. Seen. He put a playlist like together. Anfrax, didn't he? he had Anthrax on it, yeah, he had Metallica on it, you know, proper Valley's options. <laughs> He's, uh, yeah, yeah. I watched an interview he did, and he said he was a big um, Anthrax fan because of his dad. His dad's a massive uh, metalhead, and the Anthrax was his favorite band, so he got to them. I, I like Anthrax as well, I love thrash metal. I, but, uh, I saw yeah. them at St. David's Hall in about uh, oh, 1988, I want to say, oh. 1989. Good? Were they good live? They oh, they were excellent. Yeah, yeah they were super That's where Joey Balladonna could sing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Okay, so that's that playlist. Now, next week, I said we was going to do Rodri's last week, but we will do it next week, because Roger Williams' is a much better playlist. Uh, but you've seen now, I never knew, it's a few phonic songs and, and that yes. on it. So uh, that, that's a much better playlist to get our teeth into. Okay, yeah, so let's look forward to this weekend then. So it's Sharks versus Dragons um, being played at the Hollywood Bets Kings Park in Durban. Kickoff time <laughs> of five. I know it's ridiculous. Well, they're, they're the Hollywood Bet Sharks, aren't they? That's their full title. Yeah. But uh, yeah, Hollywood Bets Kings Park. Uh, five past five kickoff time. The referee is Frank Murphy from Ireland. Um, oh. I, I don't rate him at all no, as a ref. I don't know what you think of him. He's pretty bad. <laughs> Not a good start, this is it. <laughs> but the game is live on S4C as well as Fireplay. So uh, if you want to watch Fireplay, you get the really biased um, South African commentators who know absolutely nothing about Welsh Rugby or the Dragons oh. and will probably get their names wrong. So uh, I would advise you watch S4C uh, for this one. How are we feeling then, Gav, about the Dragons going to South Africa? Because we go there now with a bit of confidence, don't we? A bit of momentum. We've had a really good win. But we do have 14 players unavailable for this tour. And there's some big names missing. You know, we don't have the likes of Basham, who's obviously suspended. We haven't got Bertrand, Leon Brown, Ben Carter, Elliot D, Jack Dixon, Dan Lydia, Rodrigo Martinez, Angus O'Brien. Some really big names there. And... Of course, as predicted, and I did call this out on the rap pod, the Sharks have brought back their Springbok players into camp. So they'll yes. have Ivan Etzebeth, Ox Niche, Makosi Mapimpi, Grant Williams, Jaden Hendrickson, and Lucano Am um, played against Connor, um, Connor last week. So don't be surprised if Sharks name their strongest team this season loaded with Springbok players. So how do we feel about uh, this going into it? Well, so I was convinced we were going to win it. Because they haven't been very good sharks, and then I saw mm. that squad, and it was like, oh, oh, okay, <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's like that, is it? All right. So yes, just the nine World Cup winning Springboks to face. Yeah, I'm not surprised at all though that they brought back this Springboks because the sharks they're a very strange team. They incredibly underwhelming given the squad that they got, even without this Springbok players. 
they still got a pretty good squad, but it's just something not right there, is it? They're yeah. very disappointed and underwhelming. And I thought the same last season. Because you know? I'm old, I can remember when they were Natal and yeah. they were really weird and inconsistent side even then. Yeah, but they really should the be doing better than yeah, the, the the squad they got, like I say, no, they've lost to the Seba, they lost to the Ospreys in London. So they've lost their first five games. So they're at the bottom, they're gonna be desperate for a win. There's no way they're gonna to want to be losing two back 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 to back home games. So no. they brought back this spring. I could see it coming a mile off. I, I knew I knew this would be the case. And I know a lot of people are saying, Oh, this is a really good opportunity for the Dragons to go down and get a result. But you know, I it's all very well saying that, but you gotta look at the players that we got missing, first of all. Then you factor in the players that the Sharks will have coming back. And also the other fact is Welsh teams just don't do well in South Africa. No. You know, I know Cardiff had a really fluky one off freak result against the Sharks last year when they nailed them. You know, that will never be repeated again. And fair play to Cardiff, yeah, it was it was a great day, but that was just, you know, one of those freak results. But as a general rule, Welsh teams in South Africa, they well, we saw what happened to the Scarlets, didn't we? You know, earlier this season, they they just get slaughtered because they can't cope with the power and they struggle to adapt to the the conditions. Yeah, yeah it's it's going to be an incredibly difficult game. You know, because I, I you know I felt a level of confidence and I saw saw that squad and I was like, oh my god. Yeah. You know that's that's going to be a a very tough game in tough conditions as well. Yeah, it always seems to rain as well in Durban. It, it always seems to be, you know, sort of heavy weather, doesn't it? You know, it's windy. Not beautiful it's, weather. It's, it's windy, yeah. apparently. Yeah, because uh, the boys were saying on the rap pod that might suit the dragons, but actually, I don't know. I think we prefer it on a flat track, with, not on a hot day. I think that would, you know, yeah. for our our running game, the way we want to play, the brand of rugby, I, I don't think is really suited to, to wet heavy it's weather. It suit our flyers a bit more windy, you know. Uh... Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's going to be a tough one, this. Like I said, I know some people will be thinking, well, you know, Sharks are on the table, opportunity for Dragons. But unfortunately, it's not as simple as that. Because uh, as poor as the Sharks are, when they got their Springbok players back, and they will be a lot better, and playing at home, that's that's massive for them. That's a big advantage. And John Plumtree's under a lot of pressure. He, you know, he's had a lot of criticism in the South African um, rugby press. So they're going to be desperate to win this one. Yeah. And then after this game, we got the Lions. So, um which I think for me, this South African tour, this is a free hit for the Dragons of because it is, yeah. no, nobody's expecting us really. No one in their right mind is going to go expect the Dragons to go down there and pick up a couple of wins, right? No. But if we can come back with some bonus points, if we put in a performance, for me, this tour is about performance. Like we all want to win games, of course we do, but we have got to be realistic. We're cut up against some real heavyweights um, we... in, in those packs. You know, the Lions have got big men. We know the Sharks are going to have their spring box. But I genuinely, got I genuinely think we could get something against the Lions. Yes. Shark, could, yeah. Sharks. But Lions, yeah, potentially. Well, we played them three times last season, didn't we? And we should have beaten them on all three occasions. So we actually drew it um, out there when we played them in Europe, wasn't it? Because they yeah. came into the Challenge Cup. So we should have beaten them then. But we could have beaten the Lions. I think if we are going to get a win... It's more than likely going to be against the Lions, but they are a good team, the Lions. Yeah, yes, they yeah. are the weakest out of the South African franchises, but they're still a good team. But um, yeah, I, 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 I know the, what you mean. I miss the Cheetahs being in the, uh, you know, you always got to win with the Cheetahs. Bring the Cheetahs <laughs> back. Seven Kings. Although we lost oh, to the Seven Kings. Yeah, we did. We yes. actually went out there under the Chapman days. We they absolutely battered us, were they? 45, 70, some silly. Though. Dorian Joseph fly off. And terrible team that was the, the very dark days when Bernard Chapman first took over. So, uh, okay, so that's that then. Yeah, we're in South Africa. Two tough games coming up. I mean, I would much rather the Dragons be facing Sharks and Lions than doing what the Scarlets had to do and face the Bulls and the Stormers, mm. you know? So um, my expectations are low as long as we go out there and perform. We, we just got to chuck it about and we just have a crack. You know, what I don't want to see is what we saw with the Scarlets where they get absolutely destroyed because that won't do our confidence no. any good. No. It, it won't do the, you know, the optimism any good for supporters. So I just want us to go down there, front up, have a crack. Even if we put, you know, if they put 40-odd points on us but we came away with a bonus point. 
Yeah. That's something to come back home with, isn't it? Yeah. I, I would take a 40 28 loss. Yeah. No, I would as well, definitely. If, if it resulted in a, a bonus point of any kind, yeah. I'd be up for it. So, what's our prediction then, Gav? What, what are you going for? Is that your scoreline? Yeah, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to I'm gonna say Sharks by 12. Yeah. Sharks by 12. Okay. Um, I said on Monday, Sharks by 8. But having now seen the players that they could have back available for them, it could be more than that. But I'm going to go for Sharks by eight. I just really need to make it as scrappy and turgid as possible. Well, yeah. Don't we? Yeah, just slow everything down. Don't allow them possession, any bit of possession. Disrupt it, disrupt it. Kick it, but make it difficult. Kick it, shove it in the corners. Just yeah. make them run about and just don't give them possession anywhere in our half. Yep, that's what we need to do. So uh, we'll see how that goes then. Um, I think that's it for tonight, Gab, isn't it? Is there anything else you want to I, I I would say so after the bombshell you've dropped about Genesis. I think we've probably... <laughs> oh, you're not going to let me forget that, are we? <laughs> <I> never. <laughs> I'm going to wake up in the middle of the night just go, what? I can't believe you said that. <laughs> <laughs> that really wasn't a popular opinion, was it? <laughs> Wrong. I stand by every word. No, wrong, <laughs> not unpopular. <laughs> oh, right, okay. Then. Gav, thanks as always. It's been an absolute pleasure. And also thank you to Adam, our guest. I really enjoyed tonight. I enjoyed yeah. that chat with Adam. He's very honest, wasn't he, just about love you, even about the URC. And uh, yeah. I think that'll resonate well with a lot of supporters, his thoughts on the URC. I, and, I, and I think if you can listen to what Adam says and still goes, oh, come on, you just need a man up. I think you probably need to reconsider your life uh, your life choices a bit because you know he's talking about so serious serious stuff there absolutely uh, thanks once again to Adam thank you Gav and thank you for listening um, we'll be back next week where hopefully the damage won't be too uh, severe against the Sharks but uh, let's back the boys and let's see what they can do Upper Dragon so uh, yeah we'll speak soon thanks again Gav and good night bye everyone